Welcome back to data structures and uh, its applications. Now, we shall have uh, the topics that we have discussed in the previous session, uh, the continuation of that, the applications of uh, recursion. We have uh, one more topic to discuss, which is nothing but the Ackermann's function. Uh, recall that we have discussed uh, examples like factorial, GCD, Towers of Hanoi. Now we have one more topic, Ackermann's function. So let me just move on to the PPT. Yeah, so we have the Ackermann's function which is defined uh, recursively. So this particular function has two non-negative integers as parameters m and n. How is the function defined when m is equal to 0? It's nothing but n plus 1. And uh, for all values m greater than 0, and n this time if it's equal to 0 so we have m minus 1 comma 1 but this is again going to be a recursive so only this one will be an escape mechanism so that means until m becomes 0 so we need to keep on calling the Ackermann's function so on the other hand when both m and n are greater than 0 then we have a, a sort of recursive uh, call but as one of the parameters again is recursive so this is something different from the previous examples where we had double recursive where it's an expression we have left hand side operand with one recursive call and the right hand side uh, operand another recursive call for example fibonacci sequence Fib of n minus 1 plus Fib of n minus 2. So two are independent uh, kind of uh, recursive calls, but here it's not like that. Now within the recursive call, you can see that the first parameter is a normal one m minus 1, but the second parameter is again a recursive call. So this is a bit uh, difficult in terms of uh, you know the evaluation of the function itself. But the question is that where this Ackermann's function will be of uh, usefulness. Uh, if we look at the way in which the Ackermann's function is defined, it's nothing but to bring in the concept of what is known as getting the uh, higher level operation from the basic one. Uh, in other words, it's being extrapolating the basic one. For example, multiplication comes from addition, exponentiation from mul multiplication, and so on. That is, uh, the repeated operations of addition will lead to the multiplication, something like that. So we have the idea coming from this uh, concept of extrapolating the sequence of operations, and uh, the same thing is true even if any such kind of recursive operations are <coughs> required. In fact, I'll show you some of the exercise problems which we can easily define. You know, the calculation of your multiplication with repeated additions or recursive kind of additions. And uh, if you look at the actual, uh, uh, the straightforward applications of this, it's nothing but that we can use this concept in comparison the efficiency of certain procedures and uh, we can test the uh, the efficiency of how the instructions are executed in a particular machine and uh, there's another function called as inverse accrement function now uh, recall that accrement function actually grows very fast in fact faster than the exponential growth, uh, but uh, the reverse or the inverse Ackermann function actually 
is one which grows very, very slowly. So these concepts are a bit useful in uh, in calculating the efficiency of certain functions and supposing these functions are programmed and then put onto machine. Now these things can easily be uh, ascertained, but otherwise the actual applications are not many as far as the increment function is concerned. So we shall just pick up a few examples in order to explain this function more effectively. Yeah, we have the example carrying m value as 1 and n value as 2. Both are greater than 0 so that we can come to this particular option. There's a third one where we have both m and n are greater than 0. OK, so now supposing if uh, m is equal to 0, that means it's not uh, the case now because m is greater than 0. And uh, we have uh, to call this increments function again and again. So m minus, so it comes to the third option, of course. So m minus 1 is 0. And again, you call a Kremens function with m value as 1, n minus 1. That means 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. OK, so now in order to evaluate a of 0, come up this, you know, this itself is a recursive call. So first we, we have to you know, expand this. So there is a call for a, that means a Kremens function carrying m value 1 and n value 1, both are greater than 0. So again, it comes to this. So that in turn uh, leads to another call with m minus 1, which is 0, and a of m, which is 1 comma 0. So you can see here a of 1 comma. So this case, in this case, m is greater than 0, but n equal to 0. So it comes to the second option, where again it leads to the increments function calling. So this time m is reduced by 1. So you can see here a of 0. I, I just repeated the same thing, but this time m minus 1, which is uh, 0 comma 1. So this is 1 because n is 0, it returns actually 1. That's the idea. So when this function is called a 0 comma 1, then the third, I mean the first option is select because m is 0, so it returns n plus 1. What is n plus 1? 1 plus 1, 2. So this function leads to 2, so a of 0 comma 2. a of 0 comma 2 since m is 0, so it again plus 1, that is 2 plus 1 is 3. So a 0 comma 3 and since this doesn't call anymore because m is 0, sorry here m is 0, so this will be n plus 1 which is 4. So increment function of 1 comma 2 is nothing but 4. So again, wherever you get the invocation of the increments function, we simply keep calling this. Now fortunately, this has no additional operations to be performed. It is just recursion within recursion. So this is part of the recursive call again. So evaluation becomes easier, but it, it, it goes into a nested kind of uh, operations, one within the other. OK, so we can easily uh, translate this into an al algorithm. So if m equal to 0, we are returning n plus 1. And in case if n equal to 0, so again it is a recursive call, but this time reducing m value because only when the first condition is when m is 0 because all the time we need to keep getting it. So we need to return increments function again m minus 1 and keep sending these values. OK, so this is the incoming function. That means calling this function from the uh, main function. OK, so this is the increments function and uh, I leave it to the viewers to actually write a recursive tree uh, like what we did earlier. Uh, the same thing, you know, we can just have it. Right, so we have uh, a lot of uh, functions 
which can be written in terms of uh, a recursion like uh, to find the product okay i think we have here we can just have m and n i think because we have used uh, m and n here within the function so this need not be with another set of labeling or naming convention so i can actually have m and n because i am referring to these parameters itself not global variables so these are local variables so let it be m and let this be n so whatever the value of uh, m and n for example in this case we had 1 comma 2 so i can just take it as 1 and 2 these values so when since uh, if m be equal to 0 it's not and is n equal to 0 no it is 2 so obviously it comes to this so it keeps calling by sending these values with reduce that is 0 and then again this would call acrements function so like that as we have explained in the previous slide this keeps calling so only the naming convention or the variable names or the parameter names can be the same here because that makes sense in order to use that right so we can write recursive functions in order to find for example product of n natural numbers so 1 into 2 into 3 into you know like that so we can we will discuss the solutions for this uh, uh, in, in in later part of my lecture but this is just to give you a glimpse of that what kind of problems can be solved by writing recursive functions for example assume that i want to find the largest element in a given set of array of elements let's say so i want to find the largest now uh, ordinarily that means iterative method may be easier for example you have already studied the algorithm for this finding min or max so in this case max so first element is considered as the largest and you keep comparing you know the rest of the elements with this uh, until you get the last element now in the process of comparisons each comparison now if you find an element which is greater than the current one now save that and keep repeating this or the end of this loop or repetitions you will see that the largest one will be saved in some local variable so for example assume that i have a set of values and let's say temp is the i assume that this is the large okay i'll just delete this and pick a pen so that it becomes a so i have uh, you know a set of elements array in which it's stored right so i can just assume that the first one let me call this as a a of 0 as my largest okay or maximum whatever it is so i call this as stem now i just compare this with you know the rest of the element that means i need a for loop so for i equals 1 to n minus 1 assuming that say array until the last one <coughs> if you know a of i is greater than t because that's what it's assumed first element so second element onwards you are trying to come if this is larger than what we have assumed as the largest then save that so that a of i will be the current largest okay keep repeating this uh, uh, in case if it's not of course t is not altered still that will be the largest so go to the second uh, sorry the third element and again do the same thing and in case if that is the larger than the current largest then you can save that so at the end of this for loop you will see that t will be having the largest element so this is fine for an iterative kind of uh, methodology to find the largest element but what we want here is the recursive methodology so you need to uh, do the same process or same job 
again and again, but you should provide an appropriate means for coming out, escape mechanism. So I repeat again that whenever you design any recursive function, make sure that you provide this escape mechanism, which is normally done by using an if statement. Okay, So that is the kind of thing which is required before you formulate the algorithm for any recursive function. Similarly, reversing a string. For example, if I have, you know, PTU, so I want the answer as UTV, right? So it's a reversing. So this again uh, can be done by recursive method to compute n power. See, n power, I n power 3 or 2 power 3. So 2 power 3 can be calculated 2 into 2 into 2. So that again can be done recursively. And uh, to check whether a given set of elements is in the ascending order or not. I think you would have already studied, uh, you know, in, in, in some other uh, topic uh, about this with an iterative methodology. But now again, we need a recursive way. So I'll show you the uh, solutions for all this in the later uh, part of our discussion uh, with C program and I'll also execute and show how these things actually work. Uh, so this is going to be very interesting in order to design, implement the recursive way of solving problems. Right. So let's now move on to another very interesting uh, data structure. Which we call it as queues. Now, stack, let me just recall first before we define what exactly a queue is. Stack operates on the basis of last in, first out. That means last inserted element will be available first. So the insertion and deletion, that is push and pop, both the operations happen only at one end. So you, you insert the top, you delete again from the top or pop from the top of your container. Now a queue is not like that, which is almost similar to a normal real world queue where people go and stand in a queue in a, in a, in a cinema theater, or in the booking counters or in uh, temples, you know, wherever uh, uh, there are multiple, you know, clients or the people who are waiting for a server or a person who is trying to provide service to these people. All people cannot go and attack this one counter or one particular server. So there should be a disciplined way of one by one, we call it, or stand in a queue. That means one after the other can come. That's exactly what we have here, that queue discipline, or the way in which the clients or the elements are processed. It's taken one after the other in the way in which they have actually been added into the queue, because you can't simply go and stand in front of the queue because then there are people already standing in the queue. So you have to go and stand at the end of the queue. So in other words, so we say that the insertions of the queue and the deletion from the queue are not going to happen at the one end, but it's going to happen at two different ends. That means, for example, if a new person comes and wants to stand in a queue, is to go to the rear. And if somebody has to be serviced, then it is nothing but the person who stands first or in the front of the queue. So we have some kind of a queue discipline. Depending upon who has come first, will be served first. So that means first in, first out, or first, uh, you know, first come, first served basis. That means that this operates on the base of FIFO. That means F I F O, first in, first out. So whoever had come first will be removed or will be serviced uh, first. So there is an inherent uh, front and rear, which we can uh, 
you know, uh, put it in, uh, in in the part of our diagram for uh, understanding purposes. But there is no significance of which is front and which is uh, you know rear. So something has to be designated. So we call this as you know the front, for example. This may be the rear part of it because people come and join the queue from this end, and people are serviced from this end. People cannot come and stand here because there are already people standing in the queue. So these boxes indicate maybe element, maybe object, maybe a person, maybe a job, task, anything. So we'll see a lot of applications of this. OK, so that means these objects are the elements or the people are standing in the queue in a particular way. That means this fellow had come first. This fellow had come after him or her and so on. So people are standing in this fashion, which means that this person has to be serviced next. Now, once this person goes away, then the next person. So this is something like one, two, three, something like an ordering. So this ordering is nothing but a queue. You know, uh, so we, we have this data structure where people or the objects can be added into the queue from rear and deleted from the front and this queue discipline is followed, right? So that is nothing but whoever had come first will be going out. That means first in, first out. It is not last in, first out. That is totally violating the queue discipline. So we have to have this discipline to be followed in our data structure when we design the algorithm as such. OK, there are varieties of queues which we are going to discuss. What are these varieties? Now we have ordinary queues. We have circular queues. We have priority queues, right? So these are the three major types of queues which we will see. Now each uh, uh, queue, for example, circular queue may be better than ordinary queue. Priority queue has its own applications, etc. So now before we actually go into the way in which these things work, let's see some examples or applications. The number of real world examples that can be specified for the queues. I think uh, there is some shifting of. OK, so this is nothing but this figure has to move a little bit. So people standing in front of a cinema hall or people standing in front of uh, a voting booth, milk booth, billing counters, etc., etc. Maybe in a in a bus station where people are waiting for the bus to arrive and people stand in a queue so that they can get into the bus. And uh, we have uh, the second example here. Let me just correct this figure so that you will be able to understand easily. Right, so yeah. So objects moving in some assembly units, maybe a bottling industry, etc. So here what happens, this is the assembly unit. So probably uh, there are a lot of uh, jobs waiting. Uh, maybe we have two servers or single server. It all depends, but that should be a disciplined way of that. These people uh, have to go via others and being serviced in a first in first out basis. Similarly, these objects. So I can I can just bring in another very interesting uh, uh, computer related kind of uh, example here. For instance, let's assume that we have. Uh, yeah. So we have only one printer here, right? Now we have a machine, right? We have a machine. Now I have n number of jobs, printing jobs, actually one, two, let's assume three printing jobs. Now assume that I just give the print command to 
all of these three tasks. That means maybe I have, uh, you know, uh, this particular document to be printed. This is another bill to be printed. This is another document to be printed. So I simply have given all this. Now what happens? These, you know, print commands will go to the printer. So this is the print. There's only one printer and there are three jobs to be printed. So printer is connected to the machine. So what happens? All three jobs are given for printing. Now assume that each of this have some 10 pages, 20 pages, 30. So it takes time for printing. So that means I have given first, you know, job which takes, you know, 20 pages for printing. So it cannot happen all of a sudden. So by that time I have given another two set of printing commands. So the printing is going on for job one maybe two, three pages are getting printed. Then when this particular job two comes for next printing, now what happens? It, it cannot print or it should not print in between this first job printing. So first job printing is going on and the second job printing is also arrived, but it cannot merge with this. So that is wrong because it has to complete this process of printing the first job and then take up this similarly third. I may have n number of such jobs. Now, how does it remember? How does the printer know that which are the jobs it has to print on this particular way? And not only that, it has to print in a more uh, disciplined way that whoever has come first, whichever job has come first, it has to take up the that job next. So all these printing jobs will be put in a queue. Right, it will be put in a queue. That means job one has come first, job two has come next. So, so what this printer does, it takes first job, starts printing. Now, any kind of print command which comes, all will be sent to this queue, and these jobs will be waiting. Now, once the printer finishes the printing of this first job, it can take up the second, it can take up the third until this entire queue becomes empty. That means when all the jobs are finished. So that's exactly in, uh, you know what's happening even when you have a printer uh, connected to your machine or I may connect multiple machines to a single printer being a shared manner. So the print command may come from several machines in an office environment and uh, it cannot jumble together everything. So it has to be in a queue fashion. So it it, it maintains what is known as the operating system maintains what is known as a print queue in order to make sure that the jobs are printed in a sequence. So this is a typical uh, application of a queue where uh, you know day to day work also it's being used. Similarly, we have plenty of examples. For example, I may have, I may have one processor, I may have several jobs. All jobs cannot be executed simultaneously by the processor, let's say. So it has to be put in a job queue, right? So queue is a data structure which is useful in order to implement all these kinds of applications. Right, now let us have the ADT or the operations, which are the two operations. Number one, let me just pick the pen. Number one, is insert insert into the queue right number two delete now similar to stack we had push and pop here in queue we actually call this as insert and delete so insertion means inserting a new object into the queue deletion means an existing object standing in the queue which has come first should be deleted. Now we need to we need to have other kind of uh, operations like uh, you know the display as we have already shown in the stack. We need to display the queue contents at any point of time. So that's not an operation, but that is part of my ADT. I can just say it's a function, a display, which should uh, show all the elements or objects 
and their details standing in the queue or which are put in the queue. Another important uh, aspect of this queue is that queue, as we have already shown, that is not happening at one end. You know, the, the insertion and deletion is not happening at one end. Actually, it's going to be like two ends. So deletion from this end and insertion from this end. So somebody has to maintain, somebody has to monitor who is coming the next. Okay, and somebody for uh, oil insertion or for deletion, you should remember that who had come first. So whenever I want to delete an element from the queue, I should do it based upon some pointer. Whenever I want to insert, I should be able to uh, do that based upon some other pointer, not this pointer, because this pointer will not give me that idea. Hence, I need two pointers here because it's happening at two different ends, say front and rear. So front pointer will be helpful in order to delete the elements. Who has come first will be known because front pointer will point to the element to be deleted and rear pointer will point to the last object so that it knows that next object can be inserted after this. Okay, So that's exactly what it is shown here. And let's assume that the container for our queue is again static. That means it's a static implementation. It is not dynamic. It's not linked list. It is purely static. That means the array size or the queue size is fixed. So in this case, now my queue size is four elements, starting with zero up to three. So zero, one, two. So that means I can add only four objects into my queue, not more than that. So I should also detect the exception. I'll come to that later. So as is uh, just now, we have seen that we need two pointers as <clears throat> it is indicated here. R is a rear pointer and F is a front pointer. Now there are many ways of initializing the uh, these pointers, you know, rear and uh, front pointers. There are many ways by which we can actually initialize. Uh, many books uh, initialize in different ways, like front and rear with minus one and uh, increment, decrement, you know, all that. So let's let's not uh, go into all those kinds of things. <laughs> Let us follow this convention. So if we assume that the front is initialized to zero. OK, you can see here front is initialized to zero as it's pointing here and rear is initialized to minus one because no element is inserted. Uh, and remember, the first element to be inserted is at zero because of the C arrays, right? Now, follow me very carefully because we need to track the values of these R and F because now it's not one pointer, two pointers for F and R. So that's why we have to be more careful. So what I'm going to talk here is only entering into the queue. That means insertion, deletion we'll see later. Next slide. So let us assume that Q does not have any element. We can see all types of scenarios. Okay, don't worry. I will just bring in all scenarios into account. So initially no objects are present in the queue. That means queue is empty and um, with the initialization of f equal to 0 and r equal to minus 1, now assume that we call this nq function in order to uh, insert a new element. So what we should do, let's say 10 is the element to be inserted. So we need to actually increment R before we do any insertion. Because remember, uh, again, it will point to the field element. Rear is going to point to the field element. So R was minus one. When I increment that, it becomes zero. So I can insert. Now R points to zero and 10 is there in the queue. And remember, I don't alter F. F will not change 
unless it's for deletion. So during insertion or during the execution of NQ, during the insertion of N, uh, I mean insertion of any element that is NQ, the friend pointer will not change. Right. We'll see another scenario where both R and F will be reset, you know, all that. So for the moment, R is incremented and element is added. Let's assume that we want to insert one more element, 20. So same process is repeated. That means R is incremented. So when you increment R, it becomes 0 to 1. So you can see that pointed by R 20. No problem. And remember F is still pointing to 0 because this 10 had come before 20. So that's why I'm just using the, the elemental values like this. <clears throat> so 10 was the first element, 20 was the second element which is uh, inserted. Now assume that I want to insert one more, so increment R, 30. Now th fourth element again increment R, so it becomes 40. Now actually Q is full. That we'll see later. So and F you can see here because we have not deleted any element, F is still pointing to this. Now we can easily note here with this diagram that there are four objects standing in the queue and uh, first in first out. That means 10 had come first. You can see here 40 came late. That means the last one. So it's standing last in the queue. That means while deleting, I can easily see that pointed, pointed by F is the one which, to, which is to be deleted because first in, first out. Okay, now we will go for deletion. So when you want to delete, of course, R has no significance here, but F is very important because this fellow will tell me, okay, where my first element is. It's now at zeroth location. So now we have to show how the deletion happens, right? So let us assume that there are three objects for explanation purpose and obviously F is here and R is here. There is one empty location. So what happens now? Deletion is based upon this. So remove the element pointed by F, store it in a temporary variable and return. And what we should do, one more operation, increment F. You can see here, F was here. Okay, this is the original F. Now it is moved to, okay, let me just uh, erase and pick the pen. Okay, so this is, this was F. Now it is deleted, it means moved. F is incremented. Now you can see here, it points to the second element which came after 10. That means we are able to track that who is in the queue next to be serviced or to be deleted. So F will give me or it may happen even addition, you know, welcome to that. So what happens next? Assume that I want to delete uh, again this 20, the next person who is standing in the queue. Obviously this is done and F is incremented. So F will go to the second location, as you can see. This diagram shows that. Now we have this. Now, supposing assume that I want to delete this again, right? 30. Now F should not be simply or blindly incremented here because F, if it points here, it is point, I mean, pointing to an unfilled element, which is wrong. Because next time when you call deletion, it may return junk. Now that's wrong. So what we should do is we should find out whether F actually has reached the last element in the queue. How do we know that? It's very simple. If F catches R, that means when F equals R, we have only one object or element in the queue. That is the knowledge because it cannot be more than that. Rear is the one which is pointing to the last one, obviously. You see, now I have three people. Now this fellow is gone. This fellow is gone. And remember, R is here. R is not changed at all. Nobody has come and added into the queue. Now R points to this object 
and F was here, came here and then here. That's it because now when F catches R, we can easily note that this fellow will be the last one in the queue unless there is somebody who has added next so that R will move, would have moved. But in this case, it's not like this. So when F catches R, we can easily note that is the last element. So what we should do, we should actually reset this F and R. So F goes to 0 and R goes to minus 1. So this is minus 1. F goes to 0, R goes to minus 1. Because no more uh, elements are there. And hence, we can easily show that the Q is empty and we can start adding elements to it. So there are a lot of scenarios, as I said earlier, we can just show that what happens when we try to add when uh, certain situations like this are there. So that we will come later because we'll not put everything together. Viewers may get confused because I want to concentrate first on exceptions. Now, so what are these exceptional cases? Overflow and underflow similar to stack here also because it's a fixed size array. So we cannot keep on adding elements because we have some limitation on the container itself. So we have four, uh, you know, elements only can be added. So when I consider this situation where we have filled all the, uh, you know, array locations. So this is the first element, the second, third, fourth. So R is here. Now, supposing assume that I want to add one more element to this, I should know whether the Q has enough space or not. How do I know? Based upon R. So R equals max minus one. Same thing like we did, you know, top in stack. So when R is max minus, so what is max four? What is max minus one? Three. So R equals three. That means it's overflow because it cannot go beyond that. Similarly, we can detect underflow when f is 0 and r is minus 1. So that means r is minus 1 means it is not pointing to anything. That means no elements are added. Uh, but f may be 0. See, for example, uh, assume that I have only one element which is added, you know, like this. So this may be like, you know, this is the only element uh, in the queue and uh, f is pointing to zero and so it it cannot be called as uh, like you know uh, underflow so what we can uh, see here that r is minus one and f is zero may be the one which will give us an idea that no objects may be there in the queue in which case we can just flag an error or an exception called as underflow. So for overflow, check R. For underflow, we can check these cases in order to find out whether uh, we need to, I mean, we, whether we can add element or whether we can delete element. So only when these conditions are not there, that means these exceptions do not happen, then we can actually do the required operation of adding or deleting. OK, so now before we go into the algorithm, let me just, uh, 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 you know, talk about some kind of uh, cases, other cases, you know, other use cases which may be of usefulness in order to understand how algorithm can be built or return. OK, now uh, let me just take this case of we have uh, we had three elements. We have deleted one, so F came here and we have one more space. There's no problem. Now in this scenario, let's assume that somebody calls enter Q. So it's very simple that R will be incremented. So R comes here, right? And I can just uh, say 9, 9. Because I can check whether uh, it's full or not. 
and uh, in this case it's not because uh, r is not equal to max minus 1 because 4 minus 1 3 it's not it's actually max is uh, 4 minus 1 is 3 it's actually 2 r is pointing to 2 that means still if we have space right so we can easily increment r and then push this new element no problem that means r is pointing to the last element which is inserted into the queue it's tracking similarly if i in this situation after this assume that i want to delete no problem still because we are not bothered about rear pointer so the front pointer it will try to delete and move this front pointer here so this is not this you know this is gone and f so i can now delete 30 and catch up r you know when f equal to r again delete you can just reset it works fine now another biggest problem here i mean one of the disadvantages which we have here in the ordinary queue is that now forget about all this coming back to the same diagram Okay, let's assume this scenario. Right, we'll start from here. So we have uh, not deletion, let's assume that insertion. So I want to insert one more element. So what happens? The rear pointer is checked with the max minus one, it's still space is there. So I can insert, so R comes here. That means R plus one, which is three, and now insert this new element pointed by r so that is a of r or q of r equals 3 that means sorry 99 so 99 goes to the third location perfectly all right now let us assume that we want to add one more or insert one more what happens there is no space according to the exception checking is r equals max minus 1 the condition is true because what is the value of r? It's 3. What is max minus 1? It is 3. So what happens? It is full. So what is the problem here? Actually Q is not full. Q has two locations still empty here, this side. See, total is 4. Only two objects are there in the Q. Still there is space, but according to our method, when r equal to max minus 1, we simply declare that it is full. So what's gone wrong? that is the drawback of the ordinary queue so we are not tracking that which locations are free which locations are occupied by the objects we all depend more on f and r right that means front pointer and the rear pointer so instead of this we can actually modify our methodology of tracking this you know elements and with the front end, so we have to manage with same front and rear pointers only, but we have to, we have to find out whether we have still space or how to use this space, if at all it's there. So the real Q full is this, is this. Because F is pointing here, R is pointing here, absolutely no problem, no, uh, this one, you know, uh, space, but this is a situation where I have two locations free, but according to our algorithmic statement, it will give me that it is not. So let us solve this problem with some other method later on. So we will now stick on to the same method, even though some space is free, but we will not be able to do that because of this, you know, way in which we track the uh, rear and front pointers. Now we'll go for the algorithm. So algorithm is very simple. For the uh, insertion into the cube, it's very straightforward, where you first increment R and put the element pointed by that. Whatever the element you want to insert, just add that. So let me just show that first. Of course, initialization is obvious. Yeah, so concentrate on this part of the algorithm we'll come to this later so let us assume that uh, q is the variable where it's a static array 0 to n minus n where n is the maximum size and the rear pointer because the front pointer is not required and the element to be inserted is e so we have all these parameters 
right if r equals max minus 1 or n minus 1 where n is the size of the q so what you say q is full that is exception that's what we have shown in the previous now otherwise you can actually insert that means you are still space so increment r first and push the element or put the element or enter insert the element into the q pointed by r that's very simple so first increment because it's pointing to your field element first increment r and then insert this element into the q so now it's uh, two instructions two statements under the else class now coming to the deletion you have to do a bit of uh, other work for first check underflow if f equal to so instead of checking both you know f equal to 0 or equal to minus 1 we can simply say that f is greater it's one and the same so when f equals 0 or equals minus 1 what does it mean f is greater than r so all the other conditions f cannot be because f can catch r but f cannot cross r you can see here in all these cases f will be less than r. f cannot be greater than r so only in this case only in the case of underflow or when it is initial values you can see here f is 0 r is minus 1 f is greater than r so all the other cases either it will be equal or greater okay so when it is equal it's empty we have to reset okay so when want to delete any element from the queue just extract that element pointed by f so that is what is done here now if f equal to greater than r underflow you can't do anything and uh, you know otherwise you have to do all this and one more checking this is very important so that's what i was trying to show one more small checking has to be done okay whether uh, the front pointer uh, is pointing to r that means rear pointer that means when f equal to r i think we have shown here i'll just delete all this or erase yeah when f catches r you can very easily show that deletion is possible we have done that already in the first few statements but we need to reset you cannot simply increment and keep quiet you know so I am not incremented yet. I will increment depending upon whether f has already reached r or not. So if it is not, then ordinary way I can do it. But supposing if f catches r, then I will reset. So this is the reset of pointers f equal to r equal to mine. Otherwise, I simply increment. That means I have more elements in the queue. So that is a different scenario. For example, assume that I want to delete here. So f comes here. f is not equal to r so i need to actually increment i have extracted this i need to increment now in case if i have only one element if in case so i i have extracted this and saved in a temporary pointer i mean variable but i cannot increment this blindly <clears throat> i need to check whether f equal to r if so i can easily reset them that's what is done here so that's the part of the code or the algorithm which is done here so you have extracted because it's not an underflow still element is there but we want to check whether there's only one element or more elements if it is one do this otherwise simply increment and return the stored element so we can easily uh, understand this algorithm both for uh, adding any element into the queue or deleting from the queue so the operations will happen in in a way like uh, first in first out kind of thing but with a drawback of course as i will said that even though we have space we'll not be able to use that space unless we have some other kind of mechanism so that is nothing but by using circular queues right so this is uh, a queue which is flat <clears throat> because we assume that you know it's like this it's a flat queue where we have front pointer we have a rear pointer 
people come and join here, people may go away from here. So this is like like uh, uh, you know a flat way of visualizing the operation of the queue. So obviously we can move the pointers from one direction to the other. There's nothing like back and forth movement, etc. Uh, etc. Et you can see that front pointer moves from left to right and rear pointer again left to right, depending upon whether the elements are inserted or not, all that. So we're not able to utilize the space as we have shown here. Yeah, so here you can see that, uh, okay, not here, maybe here. Supposing if I have 40 here, and my rear pointer comes here. That is, this is filled. Rear is not here. Still, I have one space, one element space. Now, if I can imagine a queue which is not flat, but maybe a circular like this. That means that if I can see this space, if I can notice that there is some space available here, uh, and I can insert some element. It's fine. So flat way of visualizing the queue always leads to this drawback, but visualizing in terms of a circular fashion may give me some advantage of utilizing this unused space. So that's exactly what we will be discussing in the next session about what is known as a circular queue, but designing a circular queue, that means algorithm is not so easy. In fact, there are varieties of algorithms available, but I'm going to uh, teach the best one and also the simplest one, easy to remember. There are a lot of algorithms which people have already tried, but uh, with global variables and all that, I will not go into the history, but it's going to be very, very easiest way of implementing or writing the algorithm for circular cube. So that will be discussed in the next session. Thanks for watching and please do join with my next session on circular cubes. Thanks once again.